Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you here to Des Moines University. For those who don't know me, I'm Angela Franklin. I'm the president and CEO of Des Moines University. Um, we are, as many of you probably know, a 118-year-old health sciences university. Of course, Des Moines University is our seventh name change. You may know us as the Old Steel College or the University of Osteopathic Medicine and Surgery, but we are still that same institution that has a very noble mission of improving lives in our global community by educating diverse groups of highly competent and compassionate health professionals. So we're so pleased that you're gathered here with us today. Um, thanks to some of the efforts of our student leaders, um, our administrative team, we really pride ourselves on reaching out into the community to be of service in a number of ways. In convening forum just like this is a big part of who we are as an institution. You know, our engagement in the community, advocacy, the work of, of impacting the lives of the citizens that we serve is a big part of who we are as, an, as a health sciences university. So this event today is something that we're really proud to be a part of and to support. So thank you for joining us for the forum and discussion on ending human trafficking. So I have the pleasure of introducing our Senator Chuck Grassley. Senator Grassley has earned a reputation in Iowa for keeping in touch with the people he represents and in Washington for standing up for common sense and holding government accountable. Chuck Grassley does his work with a work ethic that can be traced to the Butler County farm where he grew up and still lives today, and to his days as a young father of five who worked three jobs. Chuck Grassley served in the Iowa legislature and the United States House of Representatives before winning election to the Senate for the first time in 1980. Today, Senator Grassley holds the record for the longest record of not missing a vote of any senator in office. Senator Grassley also has conducted at least one meeting in each of Iowa's 99 counties every year that he served in the United States Senate to encourage participation in the process of representative government. In Washington, Senator Grassley has been a leader in shaping legislation to improve the quality of life for Americans and to expand the economic opportunities for individuals, families, and communities. He also serves as chairman of the Senate Committee on the Judiciary and has helped lead the effort to enact legislation to establish strong anti-trafficking measures that target predators who traffic innocent young people. Senator Grassley has been a long-standing friend and supporter of Des Moines University. We thank him for that. And we're also so pleased to welcome him to campus to join with us in this most critical issue of ending human trafficking. Senator Grassley. Thank you, uh, President Franklin. Uh, also, thanks for times that I've been in this audience. Uh, sometimes you've been with me and sometimes you haven't, but I've been able to make use of this facility uh, several times, and I thank uh, Des Moines University uh, for that. Uh, I, I've got something about this program uh, that uh, I want to speak about but I think I should invite all of you who maybe wouldn't think about uh, keeping in touch with us on a long-term basis, whether it's on human trafficking or anything else. I always stress that when it comes to First Amendment freedoms, we always talk about freedom of press, freedom of speech, and freedom of religion. We don't often talk about the, uh, uh, the other one, the right to petition your government for redress of grievances, and uh, I, I, I don't think you should put the uh, emphasis upon grievances like I just probably did, but that would mean any sort of communication that you might have with us that we ought to receive from you and take under consideration. So in regard to this issue of human trafficking, that would be uh, through my office uh, with Evelyn Fortier, who's here with us today, uh, or maybe it's other issues, whoever you want to, but I hope you feel free uh, to contact us on a regular basis, and even if it isn't anything more than just giving us your opinion on certain pieces of legislation. I encourage 
a representative government being a two-way street, uh, those of us elected, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the people we serve like you, uh, there must be dialogue in order for representative government uh, to be a, a, a real factor. So I'm here today for this roundtable. I've had the uh, opportunity to have discussions on this very subject uh, with, uh, with uh, people in Washington, D.C., uh, roundtables there, but it's also necessary to make sure that we bring attention uh, to this issue for Iowa. It's necessary that I hear directly from Iowans on this, uh, and we have an expert panel to bring this discussion out. So I, I want to welcome all of you to this uh, important forum and a discussion on what we hope would uh, end human trafficking or at least limit it to a greater extent uh, than now is a massive uh, problem that it is. Uh, many of you are in the front lines in recognizing and responding to human trafficking victims. I want to thank all of you for joining us as we seek to put uh, a hopeful end to this terrible crime. At its core, human trafficking involves the exploitation of some other human being or human beings. Sex traffickers typically use some combination of force, deceit, and even flattery to exploit their victims. The mental and physical scars associated with this form of human trafficking run very deep. Some survivors never seem to heal from their uh, escapades. Tra sex trafficking of our nation's children and adults is a growing domestic threat. A human being, unlike illicit drugs, can be sold again and again. That's why sex trafficking has spread to every state in the nation, and even though we don't like to admit it here, even in Iowa. Victims are turning up in, are turning up in urban, rural, and even suburban areas. As chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I last year had the honor of leading the Federal Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act through the committee and the entire Senate. This landmark legislation, which will provide new resources to help trafficking victims, was enacted last year. But I want to take this opportunity not only to highlight that uh, legislation, and that legislation will be much discussed here at this meeting, but even beyond that legislation, highlight the work of several Iowa organizations that work tirelessly to ending human trafficking. There are true leaders in this area, and I encourage you all to seek out their information and their assistance, and I think you'll find it to be very, very helpful. One of these nonprofits is Breaking Traffic, which covers the Quad Cities area of Iowa and Illinois. This group was founded by former State Senator Maggie Tinsman, who is here with us today, and I had an opportunity to have a nice discussion with her and even get some ideas on future legislation. So for all of that, I thank her, but most importantly, for the leadership. We also welcome Kathy O'Keefe, who is the organization director and one of our panelists. Uh, others that play a key role in the fight against trafficking here in Iowa include the Central Iowa Services Network, which covers the Des Moines area, the Iowa Network Against Human Trafficking, and the new Siouxland Coalition Against Human Trafficking. At this time, I also want to introduce and thank our moderator, Ms. Yasmin uh, Vaho, for being here, coming to Iowa for this. I had the pleasure of participating in a news conference with her uh, a few weeks ago. Yasmin is the co-founder and executive director of Rights for Girls, a group based in Washington, D.C. Yasmin trains judges on human trafficking and consults regularly 
with policymakers on this issue. And for that, she recently won an award for this leadership advocacy on behalf of sex trafficking victims. Finally, before we begin, I want to thank our distinguished panelists for sharing their expertise, and I'd like to introduce them to you. Stephen O'Mara, a prosecutor with decades of experience. Kathy O'Keefe, I've already spoken about, a victim advocate and human trafficking expert. Stacia uh, Han, who is with the National Center on Missing and Exploited Children, and also a former FBI agent, uh, Ann Brewer. So that's uh, the panel, and I look forward to studying the results of this panel discussion and looking forward to sharing that stuff with my colleagues as I know more uh, readily what the issue is here in the United States. Uh, in the state of Iowa. Thank you very much, and I'll let the moderator take over. Well, thank you so much, Senator Grassley. Can you all hear me? Well, thank you, Senator Grassley, so much for your leadership on this issue. Uh, he, Senator, has been a longstanding champion of the issue of domestic child sex trafficking, including reforming the child welfare system to make it much more safe place for foster care kids who too often fall to this form of exploitation. So thank you for uh, Dr. Flanken's introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, and we thank Des Moines University for hosting this discussion. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be moderating today's panel on a topic that is incredibly important to us at Rights for Girls. At Rights for Girls, we see every day the realities of how young children, and particularly young women and girls, are bought and sold for sex in communities all over the United States. Make no mistake that this is a domestic crisis. We know from the FBI that over 80% of all confirmed sex trafficking cases in the United States involve U.S. citizens, and over 40% of those cases involve the sale of American children. What we know about those children is that most of them are girls, but every day we're seeing more and more cases of young boys who are being sexually exploited. We know that many of them come from our child welfare system. So we're talking about kids who are either abused or neglected, uh, kids who were born into the foster care system and placed in congregate care or group home facilities. But what distinguishes the experiences of our American-born victims of child sex trafficking is that they're often not seen as victims at all. Oftentimes, these children are labeled child prostitutes, and they're arrested and, in many cases, criminalized for their experiences of sexual exploitation and violence. Nationally, over 1,000 American children are arrested for prostitution each year, despite the fact that they're too young to even consent to sexual activity, and despite the existence of that federal law that defines them as victims of human trafficking. So quite literally, this is the only form of child abuse where our response has been to punish and criminalize the abused child. At Rights for Girls, we believe strongly that there should be no difference between raping a child and paying to rape a child. But unfortunately, there is. We have too often condoned the rape and exploitation of our children as long as the act of rape is paid for. And the consequences of this have been really devastating because what it means is that it's the sexually exploited child who ends up behind bars as a condition of being bought and sold like a commodity, unable to access the services that they need to effectively heal from their trauma and exploitation. But it also means that their abusers are shielded from accountability for what would in any other case be statutory rape or child endangerment or sexual assault of a minor. And so that's why we launched the No Such Thing campaign to make it unequivocally clear that there's no such thing as a child prostitute, that what we're actually talking about here is commercial child rape. The goals of the campaign are very simple. It's to erase the very notion of child prostitute in both our language and media, as well as in our laws, and to make sure that these child victims are treated the way we would any other victim of child abuse. So through the campaign, we've made some uh, pretty great strides in the last year in particular. We succeeded in getting the Associated Press to end the use of the term child prostitute in reference to these children who are exploited for sex. Uh, they even updated their authoritative style book to recommend and discourage the use of child prostitute and related terminology with reference to these children. 
We also work in a number of states and counties to help them reform their laws that seek to punish these children for their victimization. And so in the fall, we worked with a number of advocates and survivors, as well as law enforcement and uh, prosecutors in Los Angeles County, the largest county in the country. And they were the first to declare that there is no such thing as a child prostitute. And the LA County Sheriff actually enacted a policy to end the arrest of minors for prostitution. And so now, in LA County, those children are met with a first responder protocol that allows them to access services and interventions instead of being met with handcuffs and detention. And right now, at the state level in California, there, there is a bill actually pending that would make this the law of the state. And so through no such thing, we're working in communities across the country to be able to protect these children and to really make clear that you know there is no such thing as a child prostitute. At the national level, as the senator noted, we have made tremendous strides. In 2014, through the leadership of Senator Grassley and others on uh, the Senate Finance and the House Ways and Means Committee, we were able to pass really groundbreaking child welfare reform legislation called the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act. And through this legislation, uh, state child welfare agencies across the country are now required to screen their existing caseload of foster care youth for sex trafficking, to connect those children with appropriate services, and to document those numbers so that they can be traced and recorded and monitored by the federal government. Uh, one of the young survivors that testified uh, on behalf of this legislation said that in many ways, foster care for her was the best preparation uh, for a life of trafficking because in her 14 different placements in foster care, she really internalized the notion and the duality of being cared for by an adult and being abused by an adult at the same time. And it was also in foster care where she first really internalized the notion of being tied to a paycheck. And so those two realities, you know, entrenched in her mind from such a young age, made the transition into a life of trafficking with her exploiter a really seamless one. And the other point that this survivor made was that when children in our foster care system go missing, there's no Amber Alerts for them. No one goes looking for them, and oftentimes they're considered AWOL and their cases are closed out. And so through the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act, these children are now required to be missing. Uh, when they're missing, they're required to be reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who you'll hear from in a moment, as well as the FBI for entry into the National Crime Information Database. And so in um, 2014, we saw the enactment of this legislation, and we're working with our federal partners as well as states to make sure that it's uh, thoughtfully and properly implemented. And then in 2015, we saw the passage of a really important piece of legislation. Uh, the senator mentioned the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act. And this is really, really significant because it's the first piece of federal legislation that focuses exclusively on domestic human trafficking victims. Again, for years, we didn't even appreciate that American-born citizens were being exploited through labor and sex trafficking. And so this legislation not only recognizes that, but uh, increases federal funding through uh, fines on convicted perpetrators at the federal level and takes those fines and puts them into a trafficking victim services fund to finance recovery services. Um, and the legislation also critically makes clear that those who purchase sex with trafficked individuals are just as culpable as those who are trafficking them. Uh, and this was a really critical gap in the field because to date, all of our enforcement efforts at the federal, local, and state levels have focused on apprehending traffickers or really targeting the supply. And for those of us on the ground and who work on this issue know that there is no way we're ever going to end this scourge until we begin to confront the demand. Because the reality is there would be no sale uh, of vulnerable individuals for sex if there weren't individuals, and oftentimes men, uh, who were willing to buy those uh, vulnerable individuals for sex. And so the JVTA makes clear that both sides of the equation ought to be prioritized uh, and are equal under the eyes of federal law. And so there's a lot of progress that's been made, and we've been very proud to work on these initiatives at the national level, um, but there's clearly much more that we can do. And so it's my honor to introduce you to four experts that are working uh, on this issue in their various respective fields, and they will be able to offer um, their diverse insight as to how they're combating the issue of human trafficking uh, in their area. And so it's my pleasure to introduce you to Stasa Sheehan, who's the Executive Director of the Case Analysis Division at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. 
Anna Brewer, who's a former FBI special agent uh, with expertise in Iowa human trafficking cases. Stephen O'Meara, who was a Nebraska's human trafficking coordinator and a former Iowa assistant U.S. attorney. And last but certainly not least, Kathy O'Keefe, who's director of Breaking Traffic, an Iowa-based uh, anti-trafficking organization who works with exploited youth. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. So now I'd just like to give each of our panelists an opportunity to tell you more about their specific area of work um, before opening it up to audience questions. Hello. My name is Stacey Sheehan, and I'm proud today to be here on behalf of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I thank you for taking time out of your busy days to be here and listen to these presentations and learn more about the issue of child sex trafficking and human trafficking, specifically in Iowa. For those of you who may not know our organization, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is a private nonprofit organization that provides resources, services, and technical assistance to families, the public, law enforcement, private industry, electronic service providers, anyone that's joined us in the fight to prevent abductions of children, recover those children that are missing, and to address child sexual exploitation. For the past 31 years, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has been working to create a national framework to address missing and exploited children. We do this through 22 different core functions of work, but specifically to trafficking, we act as the clearinghouse for reports related to child sex trafficking, and we also provide technical assistance and analytical resources to law enforcement as they are looking to recover children and also investigate those that are responsible for their victimization. So when I talk about child sex trafficking, it's a really high priority issue for the National Center because it hits right in the middle of our two issue areas. We're talking about kids that are often missing as well as exploited. Endangered runaways are an extremely vulnerable population when we're talking about child sex trafficking. In 2015, last year, one out of five of the runaways that were reported to us were also being victimized through trafficking. And of those kids, 74% had run from the care and custody of child welfare. This is an issue that we're trying to address, and now that we know it exists, we have to increase the safety net for these kids. One of the resources that we have that is a resource that all of you in this room can leverage in the fight against child sex trafficking is the cyber tip line. The cyber tip line is an online reporting mechanism that's available to the public, families, healthcare professionals, to electronic service providers like Google and Facebook and all of the sites that we all frequent online. It's a reporting mechanism where the public or anyone can report possible child sexual exploitation, but specifically child sex trafficking. If there's a fear that a child's being recruited, or if a child's been seen in public that there's a belief that they might be a trafficking victim, or if someone has knowledge about a person who may be recruiting kids or may be controlling kids, all of this information can be reported to the cyber tip line, and each one of those reports are assigned to analysts who conduct searches and leverage various different tools that have been donated through public-private partnerships to add value to those reports, to aggregate information that might be available online or add additional pieces of information because all of our reports are sent to law enforcement. And we want to make sure law enforcement has every piece of information available to be able to po possibly investigate this crime. So as we talk about these reports that we've received, we received usually on average about 10,000 a year through our cyber tip line, it's allowed us to learn a lot about how this crime operates. And one of the things that we have really seen change the game when it comes to child sex trafficking is the use of technology. Technology, more often than not now, is being used in the recruitment of kids, the control of kids, and the sale of kids. It increases the ability for traffickers to move them around with ease and to be able to sell them in a new city. Now, while technology has been used to facilitate the crime, I would argue that in most cases it's being misused because technology has also been one of the most important steps and some of the most important tools in the fight against child sex trafficking. So it's a combination. And I have an example of a case that happened last year here in Iowa where a 17-year-old girl from Waterloo 
ran away from her child welfare placement. She had been enticed online by an adult male from the Memphis, Tennessee area. He appeared to be a recruiter because very quickly after meeting her, he introduced her to a pimp. This trafficker placed an ad for her online. While she was missing, a report came into our cyber tip line that a member of the public saw the ad online and thought based on looking at the pictures that a minor might be involved. So our analysts took a look at the ad using the identifiers that were in the pictures, were able to connect it to the missing child from Waterloo. The ad was placed in Des Moines. We quickly sent this report to law enforcement. While we were running searches based on the phone number in the ad, we found 28 additional ads that were posting the child for sex across the state in Iowa. Law enforcement actively investigating. They were using the information in the ads to try and meet the child, to try and set up a date with the child in the effort of rescuing her. And we also were using the locations from the ads to send out posters of the child, to notify the public that this child was in that area and is a missing child. The heat from both law enforcement aspects and the posters, the child at one point when she was not within the purview of the trafficker reached out to her social worker. The social worker shared that information with law enforcement who were able to set up a meeting with the child. The child was recovered and during the interview, she disclosed that she was not only trafficked throughout the state of Iowa, but she was brought to Kansas as well. She's currently receiving mental health and substance abuse treatment, and the investigation into the trafficker and the possible recruiter is ongoing. So what this also brings up is not just the use of technology, but the link between missing children and child sex trafficking. It's often a part of this victimization that's not talked about as much. We see runaways and their vulnerability in terms of being out there, not having shelter, safety, security, food, money, clothing, all the things that kids need and that are provided for them. When they're missing and when they're a runaway, pimps have most definitely recognized the fact that they can fill that void. They can manipulate with false promises of love, safety, and security and manipulate that child into, even in the face of severe victimization, staying loyal to them. Now, what we have seen specifically related to endangered runaways in this country, in the past five years, we've received about 53,000 reports about missing children. 83% of them were related to endangered runaways. In Iowa specifically, in that same time period, we received over 200 missing child reports. 70% of them were endangered runaways. That's consistent throughout the state, or I'm sorry, without, throughout the country. Yet endangered runaways receive the least amount of media attention. You heard Yasmin talking about how there, there are no Amber Alerts for runaways, but yet these are some of the kids that are the most vulnerable. It's one of the highest populations of vulnerable youth in this country. Some other things we've learned by working these cases are that this is not a crime that's just occurring in big cities. This is a crime that's happening across the country. Kids are recruited in small towns and rural communities. They're sold in rural communities. They're also brought to cities, but then sometimes they're brought from cities to rural communities to address demand. So it's not whether it's a big city or a small town problem. It's a problem that exists everywhere, and the only way you're not going to see it is if you're not looking for it. Some other trends that we've seen are that we're seeing teens being targeted that sometimes a lot of the, the visuals that you'll see are of extremely young children. But what we're seeing at the National Center is that the average age of children that are reported missing and also being victimized through trafficking is 15. You also hear a lot of references to girls, and that's true. They are victimized at a higher rate from what we're seeing than boys when it comes to trafficking. But we're seeing boy victimization or male victimization rise. Historically, Males made up about 1%, or less than 1%, really, of the reports that we were aware, aware of, and last year alone they were 4.3%. We don't know if it's an increase in awareness, better identification, or if it's an increase in victimization. These are all alarming trends to us, so I want to tell you very quickly what we're doing to respond to this, and maybe how you can get involved. So we operate, a, in addition to the cyber tip line, a 24-7 toll-free hotline, 1-800-THE-LOST, where the public can call to make reports if you prefer to talk to a person um, live over the phone instead of filling out a form online. It's also the place where families, child welfare, and law enforcement can call to report a missing child. All of these cases get assigned to a designated case management team that specializes in that case type. They leverage the resources of the entire National Center. 
and we become a resource multiplier. If you think about the resources here in Des Moines, if there was a child that was missing and they were taken to Kansas, or maybe they were taken to New York or California, Texas, do your local child welfare, or do the family that's located here, or law enforcement, have that network of resources. Who would they call in New York if they had an idea of where the child was? We have a national list of law enforcement agencies and contacts where they've been trained on this crime. They've been trained and have received uh, information about how to interview these victims and how to investigate it from a victim-centered approach. So we're able to leverage that on behalf of the families, child welfare, and law enforcement. In addition to that, we know that recovery is just the first part of this. Locating the child is extremely important, but having services to address their needs is crucial. So we have a family advocacy division that works with everyone involved in the child's case in a multidisciplinary way to do a recovery plan, to have a plan in place before that child's recovered so that the child's specific needs are addressed. Anna's going to talk to you about some indicators and things that you can look for and things that you can recognize to be able to take steps. I encourage you that if you have a suspicion, a gut feeling, or any of that, don't talk yourself out of it. Use the resources of the cyber tip line. Call 1-800-THE-LOST. We take every report seriously. We run searches, and then we send every single one to law enforcement for possible investigation. I thank you for your time um, coming today. I'm really honored to be part of this group with some amazing presenters who have a lot of tremendous experience. I've been at the National Center for over 17 years now. I can tell you that I have seen a dramatic change in awareness and recognition and identification of these victims, and I just hope we continue along this path. I thank Senator Grassley for holding this event and for being a leader in the area, specifically with recent legislation that's passed that holds everyone accountable for their involvement in this crime, and I look forward to the Q&A section at the end. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you. I'm going to be working with a PowerPoint here, so if we can throw that up. My name is Anna Brewer, and I spent 20 years as an FBI special agent investigating crimes against children. I'm currently employed at the Women's Fund of Omaha as a training consultant where I travel around the Midwest and I educate the community to realize that human trafficking happens in your backyard, to recognize the signs, and I offer a response plan, as the other panelists will do as well. So today, I'm here because the Women's Fund, for whom I represent right now, they have provided me with empirical data to help you realize that this problem is happening in your community. They have partnered with Creighton University data mining scientist Krista Price, who is in the audience today, and Terry Clark, a political scientist, to scrape one website, Backpage. Backpage.com is a place where you can buy a piano, sell your car, and buy a human being. And through their efforts, from January of 2016 to present, the data mining experts at Creighton University have identified 888 unique individuals in the state of Iowa that are for sale on a monthly basis. That does not include Omaha or Council Bluffs, because we are unable to discern if those people are in Omaha or Council Bluffs, Iowa. And you can take a look at the other numbers that I have up on the screen to show that Ames, for example, on average, has 25 human beings for sale. More than one is too much. This graph is going to show you the number of unique sex workers per 100,000. These are people that are being exploited, right? So Des Moines, Quad Cities, Omaha, Council Bluffs, Clearly, you can interpret this slide yourself, but the numbers, again, are staggering. I want you to realize that this is happening in your state. This is a heat map which blows my mind. This map shows where the demand to pay for commercial sex is happening. So clearly, most people would expect New York, L.A., Miami, Chicago, and if you're talking about the state of Iowa, possibly Des Moines or some of the bigger cities. But what I'd like to point out is just a little bit to the right and below Des Moines, the city of Ottumwa. On Backpage, if you were to go and purchase a human being, you would go onto Backpage, you would look for the state of Iowa, and you would look for a city. Ottumwa does not have a city represented through which you can purchase a human being. It is through these bigger cities that they are advertising, I will travel to Ottumwa. The only reason they're advertising this is clearly because there's a demand. 
So where are our human beings, our citizens, our boys and girls, our population from Iowa taken to, and where are they coming from? Clearly, they're coming from the neighboring states. They're coming from Illinois, 30%, Nebraska, 17%, Minnesota, 17%, Missouri, and Wisconsin. Well, that makes it not just an Iowa problem. This is a national problem. This is trans, you know, going across the state lines. And um, as you can see, again, I'm not going to insult you by reading the slides, but 50% of the um, Iowa workers move from one city to the next city. And that's going to show up in some of the signs that I want you to recognize. They try and keep the people for sale unbalanced, disoriented. They don't know if they're coming or going. They don't know where they're going to. They don't know where they've been. This is a racially imbalanced market in Iowa. There is a 4% of the population in Iowa that is African American, but 51% of the human beings on Backpage are African American. That's not acceptable. Again, you can see the white, the Hispanic, the Asian demographics. I would argue anecdotally, in my experience as an FBI special agent, that some of the populations, the Hispanic and the Asian population in particular, are underrepresented because they may not be posted online. It may be more cultural and it may be more word of mouth through their um, community in which they live. So keep that in mind when you think and you look at these statistics. It's a young market in Iowa. 18% of the people advertised online, and you'll see two examples of the advertisement below, are advertised as being under 21. Well, clearly, nobody's going to advertise a 16, 13, 14-year-old. They are thinking that if I put 18, they're going to think it's an adult, right? So if you put 18, 19, 20, there's an indication, and anecdotally we've seen, that those that are under 18, those, child, those children, are the ones that are being advertised at 18, 18 19, 20. Um, and again, just 33% are advertised as being young based on keywords and the posted age. Right there, it says teen BBW, daddy's girl, sweet high school girl. Clearly, what are they selling? What are they marketing? The indicators of trafficking, when two or more girls are advertised for a two-girl show or a number of different, um, different people have the same phone number, that's an indicator to us that they are being trafficked because that's an indicator that there's a pimp that's selling those people and controlling a group of girls or a group of people. So now, hopefully, with my, with my empirical data through Creighton University, you will realize that this is happening in your community. I'd like to take the opportunity to share with you some of the signs. I understand that many people in the audience are from the medical profession, and that being said, you will have a tremendous opportunity to come in contact with some of these vulnerable, exploited people. And I say that, I'll go through some of the risk factors, but clearly you understand that poverty, homelessness, um, language, cultur cultural barriers, um, LGBTQ community, people with mental health issues are clearly more vulnerable than others. But, um, but it is good kids from good families, stable families. And later on, if we have time, I'd love to share a story about a girl that worked at a shoe store that was recruited to move and work at a massage parlor. And ultimately, on her 18th birthday, began engaging in commercial sex at the direction of her pimp. Um, but the risk factors are vulnerable persons. So unusual tattoos, dollar signs, barcodes. These pimps will brand their commodity, right? Because that's what they, they are, a commodity. They're selling the, the human body, right? So they'll brand them with a tattoo, barcode. Um, one of the cases that Mr. O'Mara prosecuted, the pimp had his pimp name, and it was Victorious P., and the girls were branded with the same Victoria's P tattoo. Another case, the pimp's name was Kino Taylor, and the girl had barcodes on her wrist that said Taylor made. And that was an indication to her that she is his property. Um, they have large amounts of cash. They don't have a bank. They don't have a home, right? They bounce from city to city, state to state, and so they don't really necessarily conform with, with our lives, lifestyles, right? So they pay with cash. So if you're working at a hotel or a car rental agency and someone comes in and wants to rent a room for three or four days and they're paying in cash, that's a clue. They have several cell phones. The pimp will control the cell phones because they've got the business phone and the this phone and the that phone. And the girls are allowed to have, or the people are allowed to have their phones when they're working. But other than that, they're not allowed on Facebook to call their mother or father or not allowed to get on social media to, to reach out to friends or family. Um, they have no identification or their identification is being held by someone else. I tell the story that Mr. O'Mara and, and the task force went to Epley Airfield in Omaha, Nebraska, and we trained the TSA employees there. 
And um, when I go on vacation with my husband, as I'm sure you all have gone on vacation and you've gone up in line through TSA, and I go into my purse and I grab my wallet with my ID. I love that my husband opens doors for me. I love that he picks up the check when we go out to dinner. But I have my own wallet and I have my own ID and I'm going to show that to the TSA employee when I'm going through security. So again, you could be an, a citizen going on vacation, and this crime is hidden in plain sight because that could happen right in front of you. But how many of us would really notice that, right? A crime hidden in plain sight. Um, another example, I love to fly Southwest Airlines because two bags fly free. And I have my two bags. One is full of shoes and one is full of clothing. And I take those to Vegas for the weekend, right? For the weekend, but these people are traveling for weeks at a time from city to city, state to state, and they have a backpack. So if you're a law enforcement officer and you come across someone in a vehicle in a car stop and they say, oh, we've been traveling from Chicago here, there, and they've been gone for 10 or 15 days and they have no luggage, that's a clue. If you went out right now to my car and you looked in my car, you would see two car seats, you'd see a soccer ball, you'd see some sunscreen and a bunch of bottles of water. What am I? I'm a soccer mom, right? I have kids that I take to soccer practice. If you were to look into a trafficker's vehicle right now, and I'm going to show you a, a slide here in a minute, you're going to see a weekend bag. You're going to see lots of fast food bags, Arby's, McDonald's, whatever. They don't have a place to live, right? So I encourage law enforcement officers to take the trash, be nice and help them clean out their car, and then open the bag, and then take the receipt out and look at the receipt. And it says, Des Moines, Iowa, Arby's, 10 p.m., March 1st. And then the McDonald's bag, March 2nd, Omaha, Nebraska, and so on and so on. And you can start plotting where they have been traveling across the country. They're rarely left alone. They're not allowed to speak for themselves. They may use the ER as their primary care physician. They don't have a primary care physician. So you're going to see them in the ER more, uh, you know, less, with less emergent um, situation than you would if, you know, you were just a healthy person. So here are the barcodes. Um, they're disoriented. They're unkempt. We talked about this a little bit. Um, they may have lots of hotel keys, right? So again, if you're looking, if they come into the hospital with some injury and they have a person for some reason you need to go through and look for their medication or find out who they are or whatever, and you see lots of hotel key cards. They may also have lots of condoms on them, um, accompanied by a person that may be significantly older. So here's the, the visual that I like to show of a car. If you're looking in the car, you're going to see the prepaid key cards. You're going to see condoms. You're going to see frequent visitor cards to different uh, hotel chains. You're going to see the weekend bag, and you're going to see a number of cell phones, one charger in the cigarette, and then three or four coming out. Again, that's a clue, right? So screening. If you're in the medical profession, and I believe most of you are, instead of being very blunt and being, are you trafficked? Are you being trafficked? You can say, you seem to be coughing a lot. Tell me about your home life. Or you look very pale. Tell me about your diet. If you can engage and have a genuine trust relationship with these people, they may be giving you clues or answers to things that, again, if you ask the right question, they're going to give you the answer and you're going to see it. I'd like to give credit to another Creighton University student for these questions, these screening questions. Um, law enforcement or other people that may come into contact with the victim, where are you going? Where are you coming from? Uh, who are the people that you're with? Do you feel safe? Are you in need of medical treatment? Um, how can we help? Lastly, I'd like to give you the opportunity, and don't answer all at once, and I don't want anybody to answer, actually, but in your mind, think of what do you think a trafficker looks like? What does someone who exploits others look like. And I'd like to take the opportunity to show you the successful prosecutions of Mr. O'Mara of the individuals that we investigated, the task force uh, investigated, and Mr. O'Mara prosecuted. The ones that are circled in red are Iowa convictions, or they're all Iowa convictions, well, I'm sorry, the red, ones in red are Iowa convictions, and then the ones that are not circled were in Omaha. So clearly you can see that this happens, hopefully you realize that it's happening in your state and in your community. And now you can recognize some of the signs. And these are the people. They can look like anyone. The lady in the upper left uh, owned a massage parlor in Omaha, Nebraska. And here's the story about the good girl that ended up in a bad situation. She was out shopping on a Saturday with her daughter. And they went to a shoe store. And in the shoe store, her daughter, 17-year-old, walked up to the cashier. And they began talking to each other. And the mother said, do you know her? She said, oh, yeah, Mom, she's in my math class, and we play soccer together. Oh, okay. So now the mother knows that it's a high school senior. She walks up to, Tammy Shuck walks up to the young girl and says, do you like working here? 
So I love working here, but I can only work here on weekends because I have band and soccer, and, you know, my parents only want me working on the weekends. How much money do you make? Oh, I make $12 an hour, the girl was proud to say. And Tammy looked at her and said, well, do you want to make $22 an hour? And the girl's eyes got big, and she knew the daughter from school, right? So the girl left the shoe store and began working at the massage parlor and then saw the traffic coming in and out, and it was all men. And they were engaging commercial sex at the massage parlor. And the girl was being groomed. And she was being desensitized to this. And ultimately, on her 18th birthday, Tammy Shuck looked at her and said, You ready? Is it your turn? And the girl did it. This happens to everybody. Anyone is at risk. We like to partner with our community. We love when healthcare providers are in touch with us. We want to um, partner with the transportation industry, the gaming industry, faith-based community, agriculture, and we're putting together partnerships so that we can effectively communicate with each other, share all the information and the experience, whether it's empirical data from Creighton University or the anecdotal experience from the FBI, so that we can affect change. Thank you so very much for listening to me. PowerPoint also, but we're going to skip that, and I'm just going to give you five points here, and then we'll move on because Kathy has important things to say. Uh, Stephen Patrick O'Meara, uh, most of my work actually has been in Iowa. For about 43 years, I've been doing this type of work or allied type of, uh, of prosecutions. Uh, I'm not an expert, but I am experienced. Okay. So the five points I want, oh, and by the way, Anna Brewer is the founder of the Omaha Child Exploitation Task Force, so I appreciate the kind things she said about me, but the reality is there were a group, a core group of five of us that together really made that task force work. Uh, and that's one of the, my messages. You have to have a standing, proactive task force if you want to make a dent in this stuff. Okay, so... First point, tip of the iceberg. Uh, this is the conclusion of the Urban Institute report in 2014. Uh, we've had that pretty much confirmed to us now in Omaha. Uh, I think that I thought we were pretty hot stuff and doing really good things when in a five-year period from January of 2010 to January of 2015, uh, we dealt with, we rescued and assisted an estimated 200 primary victims, ranging in age from 12 to 40 years of age, uh, and also had secondary victims as young as nine weeks old. Uh, so this, this is what we're talking about. But, but 200 victims seemed to us like quite a few people for this type of case in Omaha, Nebraska in a five-year period. Relying on the information from the Creighton University Data Science Group uh, that I have come to place a lot of confidence in, um, roughly in the period from uh, November 15th of 2015 to uh, roughly um, June 6th of 2016, they say a six-month period. I say a seven-month period because I'm conservative on these numbers. Uh, if you identify the number of unique individuals who were engaged in prostitution at, at that time in a roughly a three-county area, two counties in Nebraska, and Pottawatomie County, that's Council Bluffs in Iowa, and you apply a 53% uh, likelihood to those numbers, you could argue that during that six- to seven-month period, there could be as many as 1,080 victims. We're not even getting the tip of the iceberg. Uh, second point that I want to talk about has to do with, uh, this is all over the state of Iowa, and there are some numbers now that you've seen that apply to adults and minors, but let's talk about four situations really quickly that deal with minors. The first one is actually the case that became the model uh, for part of the uh, uh, Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act. That is the one that really criminalizes, as it needs to be increased, uh, buyers of commercial sex acts, adults or minors. Uh, particularly if those adults are being victimized in circumstances constituting sex trafficking, and that's automatic for minors. It's the Jungers case. This is a case that ran between Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Sioux City, Iowa. And if you notice, Sioux City, Iowa, per capita, uh, in fact, on national maps, it shows up in red. Okay? 
So uh, the Jungers case ran between Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Sioux City, Iowa. In that case, it was a sting operation. This is what I talk about, about task forces being proactive. This is a standing human trafficking task force out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. They attracted buyers from as far away as Sioux City. Nothing unusual. You should figure at least two hours out from metropolitan areas, anybody is in the primary marketing area for sex trafficking. Um, they advertised uh, minors, and two adult males from Sioux City responded, and I, I don't remember how these facts exactly were, but roughly one of them wanted a 16-year-old minor for about an hour to do anything to that didn't leave marks, and the other adult male wanted an 11-year-old minor female for a specified sex act. And it was a sting operation, so they were caught and successfully prosecuted as sex traffickers. And that became the, really the beginning point for um, part of the JVTA. In fact, it's cited in the legislative history. Uh, I will also tell you that one of the leading cases, uh, nationally federal court case, uh, Janelle Lewis Bell case, comes out of Council Bluffs. <laughs> It was a case tried on the third floor of the main post office in Council Bluffs because that's the federal courthouse in Council Bluffs. Uh, this was a guy that was part of a, a group of pimps epicentered out of Little Rock, Arkansas, that were running a sex trafficking operation from New Jersey to Colorado, every state south of that line and some states north. I think we gathered information and evidence from about 20 states in that case. Again, this was a tremendous task force that Ann and I were able to work with. Uh, but that case definitely involved, at times, minors and definitely involved adults. But in that case, we learned how much we could use the background of the victims to convict the perpetrators. And that will be something I'm going to lead into later. But that is critical. And under federal law, that is statutory, that you look at the background of the victim, which also means it changes the way we investigate these cases. So that's, that's another case. But there's another case. Who knows where Hills, Iowa is? <laughs> Overwhelming. Okay. I know where Hills, <laughs> Iowa is. Okay. I did a lot of growing up in eastern Iowa and here. I know where Hills, Iowa is. A couple of years ago in Hills, Iowa, an adult male, 30-some-year-old from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was caught in a sting operation run by a relative of mine, I'm very proud of this, uh, who is a, uh, was at the time a deputy sheriff uh, in Johnson County. And this adult male was trafficking two teenage females from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in Hills, Iowa. So those of you who know Hills, Iowa, how large is it population-wise? It's not even that big. <laughs> no, it's not 800. The map says about 670. If it's over 550, I'd be surprised. But let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's 600 people. That guy got life imprisonment in federal court for sex trafficking minors in Hills, Iowa. The smallest population base that we have measured in, there are four different sources we looked at to do this, in Nebraska, where we have active concern that we are going to address about sex trafficking, is population of about 400. About 400. Okay? That should say something. The first case that the state of Iowa prosecuted for sex trafficking involved two minor runaways from a facility in Omaha, Nebraska, who were, quote, befriended by two adults who offered to help them travel a good distance from Omaha. They didn't get an hour down the interstate headed east when they were told flat out, basically, now we own you and you are going to have to be prostitutes. They were taken to Denison, Iowa. Who knows Denison, Iowa? Oh, well, a lot more people. It's the home of Donna Reed. What do you want? Okay? All right. So, Denison, Iowa. Population about 6,700 people. From there, one of those girls 
was being taken to Washington, D.C., which would be like going into a black hole. She would not be seen again. And at that point, they were rescued by a good effort by the Iowa DCI. But Denison, Iowa, and actually Denison is something we are familiar with from our work with the task force in Omaha and Council Bluffs. Uh, the third situation I'm going to talk about doesn't, I, I can't give you a lot of details on this, but I will tell you that Anna and I worked a case where an adult male pimp from Minnesota befriended two teenage females from Wisconsin and ended up sex trafficking them in Dubuque and Davenport on their way to other states. Okay? So, the last one, because I want to come back home, the last one involves a 14-year-old female from Omaha, Nebraska, who was enticed by a pimp into prostitution, including by sex acts that the pimp performed on her, that pimp routinely checked that 14-year-old girl out of a middle school and took her to prostitution appointments throughout the Omaha metro that included Carter Lake and Council Bluffs, Iowa. And we have lots of other stories we could tell you about, but we just covered the state of Iowa. And we just went from about 600 population to large metropolitan areas. And there are many more stories. Kathy could tell you quite a few also. But that's the point. We are not even touching the tip of the iceberg. We have to do a lot better. Okay, third point. Um, three things that we absolutely have to look at doing if we're going to attack this. And remember, it has to be proactive, which also includes outreach. Outreach, organized outreach. We have to change the risk-benefit analysis by the bad guys. Right now, they absolutely believe as a community we have no interest in pursuing them. In the Urban Institute report, they found that 21% of the pimps that they interviewed had switched from drug trafficking to trafficking of human beings because there was just as good, if not better, money and no perceived risk compared to drug trafficking. But this is also the anecdotal experience we have through the Omaha tra Task Force. When Janelle Lewis Bell was convicted in federal court, he absolutely was shocked. He never believed anybody would do anything to him. Um, we also then, so risk-benefit analysis. The second thing is demand reduction. This is just good economics. And actually, I have a slide in red, and I, you know, actually, I I'm, I'm, didn't go to the University of Nebraska, but uh, I do have one slide in red, and that's this one. And it says, no traffic, I'm sorry, no buyers, no trafficking, period. No buyers, no trafficking. So we absolutely have to make a dent in what is a growing business. And it relates to so many other things. For example, pornography. To things we don't have time to talk to here about, about youth issues. We really have to do a lot better on that. Uh, to mental health, to substance abuse, uh, to gang activity. That's a growing area of involvement in sex trafficking. All of these things are interrelated. But we absolutely have to reduce demand partly probably through enhanced penalties, but also through things like uh, drug schools or, or, or some other treatment like that for Johns. And we don't use the word Johns in Nebraska because the chief of the criminal bureau's name is John. We say <laughs> buyers, okay? All right. The third thing we have to do is supply reduction. Now, that may sound pretty strange talking about this, but this is a stark reality. We experienced, and there's plenty of literature to back this up, that there are identifiable categorical vulnerabilities of victims that make it far more likely than the general population 
that other than a clear kidnapping case, they will end up being victims in sex trafficking. This is adult or minor. But particularly with regard to children, we have things, uh, foster care has already been mentioned, any sort of institutional placement. By the way, that's probably also true for adults. But there are a number of things, children at risk, that we can and need to do much more about. Children missing from care, particularly on a recidivist basis. All of this has to be worked on. But mental health, substance abuse, uh, other activities that we could list, we can identify the vulnerabilities that really have to be worked on. In some ways, it's almost a public health analysis. It really is. But we have to work on those things if we want to seriously attack human trafficking. Um, okay. So risk-benefit analysis, demand reduction, and supply uh, reduction, particularly dealing with, with victim vulnerabilities. I don't have time to go. We have a 70-page plan in Nebraska on what we're trying to do. The Anne is part of this, and it's the Nebraska Human Trafficking Task Force. But I am going to list a couple things that we have found to be really critical. Integrated advocacy. The availability of an advocate to a victim from as close as possible of first contact with that victim, including sting operations, up to and continuing through the course of involvement, of intervention, which basically can be the rest of your life, as uh, Senator Grassley noted, for some of these victims. That means we have to take a new look, in some cases, at how law enforcement victim advocates are used, and we were privileged to be uh, associated with one with the FBI in Omaha who is absolutely incredible and really was a key part of the success of the Omaha Child Exploitation Task Force. But also we have to integrate into law enforcement operations, even NGO advocates if we want to look at that. The next, and we're just hitting highlights here. The next one is forensic nursing. And this is critical. And again, this is based on the experience uh, with the Omaha Child Exploitation Task Force. The healthcare system overall, because we know from the survivor study, the most credible one I'm familiar with right now, 89% of the victims of sex trafficking encounter a healthcare professional during the period of their trafficking. They are number one on our community partners list as we build the program we're building in Nebraska. Um, also, it has to be integrated and multidisciplinary. And again, we could talk about that, but it really has to be integrated and multidisciplinary. We have people talking together with each other that have not really talked to each other well uh, before on these kind of issues. And again, it has to be proactive. If we stay reactive on this situation, we will not make a dent in it. There's an awful lot of other things I'd like to talk to you about. So I'm just going to give you two resources, though, if you're interested to look at. I've mentioned the Urban Institute report a couple times. That's Dank, D-A-N-K, et al., D-A-N-K, et al., 2014, the Urban Institute. It's a 339-page comprehensive report with regard to the underground sex industry in eight major American cities, the closest to here being Kansas City. The other one is the health related issues report regarding survivors in, uh, of sex trafficking. Again, this is considered a very legitimate report. That's Lederer, L-E-D-E-R-E-R, -E -R, -E 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 2014, the Beasley Institute, University of Chicago, Loyola, and it's actually published in the Annals of Health, uh, health Law by the uh, Loyola Law School. So Letterer et al., 2014. There's also a fairly new summary report out. It's pretty comprehensive, UCLA put out this year. That's a good read to get into other types of reports. Thank you. Um, I've known Stephen for quite a while, and as has Anna, and I think she'll agree with me that for Stephen, that actually was brief. <laughs> um, but we are way past time now. I should have known the fifth chair was not the spot to sit in. 
Um, so just really quickly, I just want you all to know, um, as was mentioned by Senator Grassley, uh, Senator Tinsman is here in the office. She founded uh, Breaking Traffic, which we were our own nonprofit. We recently merged with Family Resources in the Quad Cities. So we are now an anti-human trafficking program of Family Resources. Um, something really wonderful to come out of that merger is that we are now expanding to provide comprehensive services to survivors of all forms of human trafficking. So not just sex trafficking, but labor trafficking as well. Um, the needs of these survivors are vast and varied. Um, Family Resources has over 20 programs, so I'm proud to say that between our program, Breaking Traffic, and the other programs there, we are able to provide uh, counseling and therapy to survivors of human trafficking, legal advocacy, medical advocacy, economic advocacy, uh, shelter, both emergency and long-term, child care, um, help with finding employment, just about anything that a survivor of human trafficking would need. Um, another one of our programs I'd like to quickly point out, really talking about not only a, a direct service, but also um, from the prevention side, is that we have developed an awareness program for middle school and high school students called Any Kid Anywhere. If you have time, just stay an extra few minutes when we're done here. I think they're going to show the documentary that we produced featuring three Iowa survivors of sex trafficking that's part of our curriculum. But we recently received a grant from the um, Crime Victims Assistance Division of the Iowa Attorney General's Office to have our curriculum Im implemented in schools across the state of Iowa, and we are doing that in partnership with our domestic violence sexual assault um, lead um, uh, regional leads, as well as the Iowa State Sheriffs and Depu Deputies Association. So when we are in our schools in the Quad Cities, which we have been for about four years now, we always partner with law enforcement to go in and talk to the students. Um, they typically cover this internet safety part of our curriculum. Um, it has nothing to do with sex ed. Everyone always asks that. It's about human trafficking, why it pertains to kids their age. We talk a lot about healthy relationships, internet safety, and then also that concept of ending demand, as uh, Mr. O'Meara mentioned. Um, and we relate that to pop culture and how that can fuel demand and try to bring it to the student's level. So that's something to be aware of. We will be um, advertising some train-the-trainer um, trainings that will be coming up regionally across the state. So if you're interested in becoming involved, in helping to spread awareness to students in your local communities, um, you can get involved to do that. We'd be really excited about that. So, um, again, we are out of time. So I wrote up on the board, um, I wanted you to be aware that the Iowa Domestic Violence Helpline, which is run by the Iowa Domestic Violence Victim and Service Call Center, um, is now transitioning into being a statewide hotline for all victims of crime, including human trafficking. So I have that number up there for you, 1-800-770-1650. Um, another part of, of the funding that we received from that grant will be using to do a statewide PSA campaign, which will feature that number. And so um, anyone in the state of Iowa can call that one central number and receive help if there's someone who is being victimized. Um, or it also, also can be used as a resource for someone potentially seeking help for somebody else. Um, I also have up there the uh, web address for the Iowa Coalition Against Domestic Violence. On their home page, if you click on Find My Location, it pulls up a wonderful map that's divided by the domestic violence sexual assault regions of Iowa. Um, so you can see where your location is, where you fall um, on that map. And then beneath the map, it lists service providers within your region that you can contact for assistance should you identify someone who is a victim of human trafficking. And again, um, I, I'm really proud to say that in the state of Iowa, we have comprehensive services here. Um, we have services specifically for um, that are um, affirming for the LGBTQ community. We have multilingual services, um, services pro bono immigration legal services for non-citizen immigrants who are survivors of human trafficking, pretty much anything you can find here in the state. Um, so again, that website would be a really great resource for you. One that I failed to write up there, but just by show of hands, how many of you are in the medical field or plan to be? Okay, um, 
Massachusetts General Hospital published a guidebook for medical professionals. It's really great for anybody. I encourage you, just Google it and look it up online. If you Google Massachusetts General Hospital Human Trafficking Guidebook, um, you'll, you'll be able to find a link to a PDF of the guidebook so that you can download it. Um, it's wonderful. It ha talks all about um, various physical and mental health issues, indicators. It talks about safety planning, case management for your patients. It's really great, so I encourage you to look that up as well. And if you want to get in touch with Breaking Traffic, I do have cards available for anyone after who is interested. Uh, but again, you can Google us too and find us as well. So thank you for your attention today. So I just want to thank our panelists again. Um, you know, I think we're going to be able to stay a little bit later. We had discussed and take some audience questions, but I wanted to quickly recap because I think our panelists made some really excellent points, some of which centered around, you know, the importance of confronting demand and how demand is really fueling the sex trade in vulnerable individuals. Um, we talked about risk factors, those foster the care involvement, as well as runaways, which, as we tell our judges and our judicial trainings, begs the question, what are these kids running from? Oftentimes, abuse or sexual violence in the home. Um, we talked about the influence of Backpage and other forms of technology that are uh, facilitating the exploitation of youth, but also using te uh, technology as a form of rescuing and, and identifying children. Um, someone raised the point around racial disparities, um, not only in terms of who is disproportionately being exploited uh, and victimized, but I would also say examining racial disparities in terms of who is perpetuating the harm, typically on the demand side. Uh, and then we mentioned pornography as well as the importance of fostering what we would call a healthy masculinity in our young men and boys that, again, contribute to the demand. Um, so I had some questions prepared, but I think in the interest of time, we're going to turn it to our audience members. So. Uh, if folks have any questions for our panelists, we have uh, people with mics, right? So you can just find somebody with a mic and feel free to ask some questions. When, when, did, we, when did we first um, start becoming aware that trafficking was occurring in Iowa. I mean, when did it become come to the attention of um, you know, FBI agents and prosecutors? Is it new or has it been going on for the decades? The case in Iowa was done in 2009. That was the case in Denison. Most, most states have begun to get involved somewhere between 2007 and 2010. The sea change moment was uh, the year 2000, when both the United States of America through the Trafficking Victim Protection Act and the United Nations through a resolution redefined slavery in terms of labor trafficking and sex trafficking and some other definitions. So all of this really is a thrust since the year 2000, and around here it's mostly 2009 to 2010. So this is pretty new stuff. Americans being uh, exploited for sex and labor. I have a question over here. Hi, my question is for Mrs. O'Keefe. Is that correct? Um, I have a daughter. Okay, Kathy. I have a daughter um, in the Waukee Community School District, and I do remember you stating that you have programs that um, where you go to, I guess, middle school. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, do you have someone that has gone to the Waukee School District, or is someone planning to go? I'm sorry, are you saying Waukee? Is that what yes, you're saying? Yes, I am okay, Waukee. Yeah. 
Yeah, so our goal with this new initiative is we're taking a train-the-trainer approach, and we'll be working, like I said, we're starting with our domestic violence sexual assault providers in each region and the sheriff's uh, offices in each region, um, as well as any other community partners interested, and we're training them on how to then conduct these presentations in schools. So um, will you come find me after? I'll give you my card. You can email me, so we'll make sure that your daughter's school is contacted if you're interested. Okay, thank you for making me aware of that. Do you have any resources geared toward the hospitality industry? Yes. I'm I'll come see you the microphone on that one, because I know if I don't, I'll never get it back. No, yes. Mr. O'Meara is doing a great job with the state of Nebraska, and we're working on that as well in Iowa. So um, we're starting in the Crown Cities area, but I know there are others across the state. So we do. We provide free training to hotel, hotels and motels, and we are partnering in the Quad Cities with the Convention and Visitors Bureau and the Quad Cities Lodging Association on that, as well as Davenport Rotary. And so, yeah, that's very, very important, and we're really taking the approach um, that, you know, this needs to be a proactive approach. We've, we did get a lot of pushback from hotels in the beginning, really afraid to get this training because they thought it would send the message that, you know, they had a problem in their hotel. Um, and we've worked hard. It's been very... Um, um, it has been much easier than the Lodging Association, we'll put it that way, and kind of flipping that around and saying that really by getting this training, you'll be preventing uh, this in your hotel and you're also being in a position to help someone out. We, uh, we also do this in Western Iowa because the reality is we're all in this together. So uh, the Coalition on Human Trafficking in Omaha a private group partnered with the Nebraska Human Trafficking Task Force uh, has a formal program. In fact, we actually coordinated with uh, Breaking Traffic in the Quad Cities when we drew this up. Uh, it is actually being looked at, I know, in Sioux City. In fact, I think they've actually implemented through the Siouxland uh, Coalition Against Human Trafficking. And actually right now the National District Attorneys Association is looking at the uh, – the program that uh, that we're using. Uh, it's really quite similar, but with some different sponsors than what Kathy does. But in both instances, we train people to go into hotels and motels and actually provide training that is more specific to hotels and motels. Oh, oh there he is on. Awesome. So, uh, briefly in the healthcare setting, uh, what are some things that might raise your index of suspicion as far as, I know you said uh, um, their sex trafficking victims are generally going to emergency medicine places. Um, what would be some less obvious signs that uh, you are treating somebody who is a victim of sex trafficking? So I actually have a brief um, real story that happened after we prov provided a training. Um, I received a phone call from a physician from an ER room, and she said, I think I have something. And I said, okay, what do you have? And she said, well, I have a lady that's in the ER that's had no prenatal care that's here to deliver a baby. And I was like, okay, step one. And upon delivering this baby, I noticed that she has a barcode tattoo below her belly button but above her vagina. Step two, right? And then she said the baby was born exhibiting symptoms of withdrawal. I just don't know if I have anything. And I said, well, what else do you have? And she said, well, the tipping point and what made me call you was the man out in the waiting room, not in the room with her, stroking her hair, telling her to breathe, that was very, very angry, staring at his watch, demanding, how much longer is this going to take? How long is she going to be in there? When are you going to get her out of there? I need her back. Because the longer she sat in that room delivering that baby, the less she could be out working for him. So that's an example of something that you might see in the medical field. Yeah, it's, it's not just emergency rooms, and it's not just well, free clinics definitely would be high. OBGYN definitely would be high. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, this is something we're actually trying to integrate proactively in what we're doing. Um, other things that really could be looked for, because we go around and talk to people about what they see, 
the same uh, particularly adult male bringing different groups of women, particularly young women, for types of services that are indicative of human trafficking. And if you read that Beasley Institute report I talked about, it, it really is compelling the extremely high percentage of certain types of injuries and long-term effects that occur to survivors, to victims in sex trafficking. But those types of injuries would also, or other effects, would also be things that should really be looked for as indicators in a healthcare setting that this is going on. Also, failure to make eye contact on a routine basis. Also, part of what Anna talked about, who controls the IDs? Also, who controls the money or how is the bill to be paid? There's just a number of things. Part of what ought to come out of this, though, um, different fields have training that they need. Some is generic, but some is specific to that profession or industry. So uh, some of that's being done. Uh, that's something we, we definitely, we have a committee that works on that with the Nebraska Human Trafficking Task Force. But l I would say look for more training. Our basic training, really, the best training is an hour and a half to two hours. And uh, we're actually rolling out two-day training that we test ran in the Quad Cities uh, uh, earlier this to, year. To rave reviews. Uh, we're rolling that out at six locations. We've actually formed regional response teams in Nebraska multidisciplinary teams and we are training them specifically with how they fill their different roles and come together as a team to work on human trafficking. So training and education are really important, mm -hmm. uh, including in, in the healthcare field. Yeah. And also uh, with that, I'd just like to add, if, if you're not aware, um, legislatively it was just passed that an office to combat human trafficking was established in Iowa within the Department of Public Safety. And um, the Iowa Attorney General's office has also just recently hired a human trafficking coordinator, and I actually was on a panel of interviewers. Yesterday, um, we are looking to hire um, someone to conduct, that would work for the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy to conduct um, trainings across the state on human trafficking. They would be most specifically for law enforcement, but um, also can be opened up to other um, systems as well. So just to make you aware of that. Senator Grassley also mentioned those specific agencies or uh, coalitions that are working on human trafficking. Again, in the, in the uh, Polk, uh, Story County areas, the Central Iowa Services Network Against Human Trafficking, which is actually meeting right now roughly two blocks from here. Yeah. Uh, but they, uh, they are really a good organization. Uh, clearly, Breaking Traffic, which I think is kind of the premier organization, uh, not only in Iowa, but in a number of other states. Uh, the Iowa Network Against Human Trafficking is morphing a little bit, but it, it's a very good organization to look at, particularly as a platform for information. Uh, and then also up in northwest Iowa, really in the three-state uh, area up there, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa, uh, the Siouxland Coalition Against Human Trafficking. And I know that the first steps are being taken uh, right now because we're kind of helping with that in southwest Iowa through a group in Red Oak that we're tying together with a group in Council Bluffs to try to move towards coalition. So uh, that's another way to get information and get involved uh, and get ongoing information. Most professions also have now, uh, like SOAR just came out, I think it's S-O-A-R, through the, uh, for the medical profession. That's like hot off the, the press. Uh, we're working with the University of Nebraska Medical Center with regard to that, but that's how I know about that. That just came out, but that's supposed to be uh, really a good resource also. I have one question. Thank you all for being here and for your great work. I, ac I actually have two questions. At what point might we think about human trafficking being called a public health crisis or an education crisis, it, more in the ilk of domestic violence to get the movement going. And the second question I have is Iowa is increasingly placing kids in foster care. And this is probably one of the, the 
fastest vehicles to get children into the trafficking system. What can we do as nonprofits or other communities, community members, to stop that pipeline? I, I, yeah, I'd like to address that. I mean, the, to your second question, Terry, um, yeah, we need to start putting more of our resources into building healthy families. Um, one, uh, another one of um, Family Resources' new programs is called Total Child. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. But it um, begins working with families with children that are, it's, I think, it's zero to five. But then um, they stay with that family until that child reaches age 18, continually wrapping services um, around the child and around the family to ensure that those kids don't end up in foster care. So, of course, these are at-risk families to begin with. But in my opinion, it starts there. We have to start building stronger families. Um, we do see a lot of family-controlled trafficking, as I know you're aware. Um, and so it's inevitable that sometimes the foster care system is necessary. Um, but again, I think that um, we could do a better job with maybe providing additional training for therapeutic foster homes um, so that kids aren't always placed in uh, group care um, facilities, um, which again, sometimes those are most appropriate. But we have a long way to go, but I think um, our, as a society in general across our nation, we have to start putting more services into um, our kids at a younger age and, um, and providing services to our families. Um, I think, you know, the first step in, in starting to recognize human trafficking and particularly sex trafficking as a public health crisis is to first recognize prostitution uh, and sexual exploitation as a form of gender-based violence for violence against women. That's something that has really been a gap in the anti-violence movement. It's something that we're consistently struggling uh, for recognition of at the federal level. Um, but I think until we as a society face the reality that prostitution and sex trafficking are inextricably linked um, and addressing everything that comes with that, right? The demand, the culture, uh, hypersexualization of younger and younger girls, right? Um, recognizing uh, the female body as property um, and addressing healthy masculinity and fostering what, you know, manhood looks like and, and a form of manhood that doesn't denigrate women and girls or vulnerable individuals, um, I think is really the first step. You know, just like you said, the domestic violence movement is a great analogy um, and they've done really excellent work to make it, you know, not a family or private issue, but really a public health issue. Um, and I think that there, there's much to be learned from that movement. Um, to your second point, at least from the national perspective, because that's my area of expertise, there is legislation pending right now that passed through the House it's uh, pending in the Senate called the Family First Prevention Services Act. Um, this is, again, it would be sweeping child welfare reform um, in the sense that it would make uh, Title IV-E dollars and the Social uh, Security Act much more flexible uh, towards prevention services. So it would allow much more flexibility in the ways in which those dollars would be used so that right now those dollars are available to states once the child is in foster care. Okay. So that legislation would allow dollars to be used towards prevention services, towards keeping that child in the home and, and providing family counseling so that we can avoid foster care placement when um, that's, that's a possibility. So I, I would say really supporting that legislation, uh, particularly in the Senate, reaching out to um, your senators. I know Senator Grassley has worked on child welfare um, there's a number of folks working on it now, uh, mainly Senators Hatch and Senators Wyden, but I would really encourage support of that legislation. Overall, too, mental health, substance abuse, and pornography are, are really big issues with regard to victimization in particularly sex trafficking of human trafficking. If, if they don't get more attention, it's going to be very difficult uh, to limit, along with the youth and family issues, but these often tie in. Mm -hmm. um, it's really going to be difficult to limit victimization, the, the supply side of this equation. I think this will be our last question. Yeah. Okay, so my question is on trafficking for large annual events. If we know that these event, annual events are happening same time pretty much every year, I'm sure there's teams of law enforcement that are monitoring Backpage and, and different sites like that. Can you comment a little bit on prosecution, because we don't hear much about that. And if if some of the reasoning is shortage of prosecution, I know they bring state 
troopers in for all over for the fair, can we not bring other agencies in for these large events to help with that? You're, you're making a in a couple minutes. <laughs> you're, you're making a presumption that I don't think is valid. Okay. And that is that law enforcement, and on a, in a general blanket sense, yes, sir. around these uh, events is monitoring what's happening. And I already gave you the potential statistics on how we're only touching the tip of the iceberg. Yes, sir. Uh, it, we need a, um, a stronger, uh, more unified approach on how we are going to address these issues. And they never occur alone. Uh, there's almost always drugs and other crime particularly violence, that are associated with this. But you also have to remember when you say a big event, where are you talking about? You're talking about in Des Moines with the uh, first round of the NCAA men's basketball tournament? Yes, definitely. I think Mike Furjack Fer said a 40% increase in what could constitute sex trafficking in, in that period of time. Uh, we know from the good work of Krista and Terry at, at Creighton that it's surrounding the College World Series that the impact may be greater in Omaha with regard to sex trafficking than, um, uh, what is it, the NBA Finals or the, uh, the, the National Hockey League uh, playoffs, the Stanley Cup Series. So, the, yes, we have to do more. We are, even where there is a standing task force, my personal opinion, and then everybody else that is now shuddering in Nebraska that I'm speaking will appreciate me saying this is my personal opinion, we are definitely not doing enough. But if you're talking about Sydney, Iowa, okay, who knows where Sydney, Iowa is? Yeah. Thank you. Um, the Sydney Rodeo certainly has its proportionate spike, and it probably involves sex trafficking. So we just have to have a different approach, and a lot of this has to do with education and training. Uh, I know of a county attorney who recently said that there is no sex trafficking in Nebraska, and the guys that are working on that are doing this to get jobs. Okay? So there's a lot of work to be done out there for education and training. But also we need force multipliers. We need other things, so we need to come together again and see how we're going to address these issues in advance. That's the purpose of a standing, proactive task force to do that, but multidisciplinary, not just law enforcement, that won't work. 